Hi, this is Scott Nygaard, and you're listening to Bluegrass Jam Along, the podcast for anyone and everyone who plays bluegrass. So my guest on Bluegrass Jam Along this week is Scott Nygaard, who you will all know from various places, from Peghead Nation, from his own records, from playing with uh, all sorts of people over the years. Uh, but Scott, welcome to the podcast. It's a joy to have you here. Thanks, Matt. I really appreciate you asking me on. It's interesting, just even that introduction, sort of this as as nominally a bluegrass podcast. I can't imagine you specifically think of yourself as a bluegrass guitarist, even though that's what a lot of people associate you with. You've played a, a much bigger range of stuff than that over the years. Right. Well, <clears throat> I mean, I have sort of been associated really with bluegrass for the last 30 years. Um, I think I, I joined Laurie Lewis's band in 1989 and and that was actually the first you know uh active bluegrass band i'd played with i i played a lot of old-time music and bluegrass and and lots of different kinds of music before that but and then you know that just kind of got me into the bluegrass scene and it kind of you know kind of went from there and most of the stuff i did was you know bluegrass or bluegrass adjacent since then yeah and i just just looking back through some bits and pieces for this interview just sort of really back the songs that i love and albums that i love that i never even knew you the guitar player on like look, looking back at something i hadn't realized for example you played the rhythm on uh the first chris Thiele record leading off right um yeah and a, a few solo, few solos on there too yeah so. and i mean the, just that first track um shadow ridge off that record is i just love it it's such a like the mm-hmm. you, it's easy to be amazed by that coming out of somebody somebody so young but it's just it just is an amazing bit of music it's a it's a wonderful thing and it's only like recently i realized that that was you yeah thanks yeah it was really fun to do we kind of went up to Chris was at what he was 13 or something at the time and living in the mountains outside of LA and they had a little, you know, home studio and Pete Wernick was producing. And so it was basically, you know, me and Pete and Chris and Chris's dad, Scott playing bass, doing, doing all the stuff there. It was really fun. Yeah. Play. It's such a great record. And then, and obviously I knew you'd played with Tim O'Brien and I sort of feel like I might've seen you play with Tim years ago. I am at the Cambridge folk festival it's around ninety yeah. six, ninety seven, maybe. Yeah, I like to say we opened for Elvis Costello because he played after us. But, you know, <laughs> there were a lot of other people over there. Yeah. That was it. That's the day I remember seeing yeah. Tim at the Cambridge. Yeah, ninety so. seven. Yeah, yeah, ninety seven. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that was that was fun. We I, we did a bunch of touring in England with Tim the last year, year and a half, and I loved it. I loved, you know we uh, we played all over and played up at the. Shetland Folk Festival and Cambridge and you know all over, all over the UK. I really enjoyed it. And that um, that sort of period with Tim, um, I heard you sort of essentially talking about how you got the gig in the first place was such a random sort of. You ended up backing him up at a, a fiddle workshop, it was completely sort of accidentally almost. <laughs> yeah, it was. I had uh, I had been playing with Laurie Lewis, and I had kind of left the band, and I'd met Tim before, just some festivals i think we and we opened for hot rise once so i'd met him but we didn't really know each other that well and um i was at ibma and kind of i don't know kind of looking for a gig in a way but more just kind of you know hanging out and letting people know i was still around and um it was just in the lobby of the hotel and i saw tim and he had his fiddle and and uh he was like hey how's it going and hey wh- what are you doing right now you know and i'm, I'm going to do this fiddle workshop and why don't you come down and play guitar? And uh, so I did. And, you know, we hadn't really played together, I don't think at all. And, you know, so I backed him up. And I remember that there was this one tune that he played called Muddy Wa- Muddy Waters, Muddy Water, uh, something like that. And I had, you know, I was familiar with the tune. I kind of first started off playing old time music when, um, and so I knew a lot of fiddle tunes and I'd played fiddle a lot. And I probably played that tune at some point, but I hadn't really thought about it in a long time. And uh, it's a tune that starts kind of going from G to E minor. And, but it's actually in D, so it resolves to G. So it's, and, I, and I didn't really remember that part of it. It's like, oh, yeah, G, E minor. And so I kept resolving to G and thinking, yes, yeah, a G tune. And Tim would kind of give this look over at me like, 
And then I realized, oh yeah, that's not working. <laughs> and I, but you know, you keep playing and you know, at, at, by the end of the tune, you know, he kind of realized, oh, he doesn't quite know this, but I keep going. And, and, uh, you know, at the end of the tune, we both kind of laughed and he later said the fact that I was just kind of willing to go with whatever he was going to play is part of what helped get the gig, you know? I mean, he didn't want someone going, oh no, I, we can't do that song. You know, I don't know that one. Cause he would call, you know, so you'd get a request for a hot rice tune that, you know, I'd, we'd never played together and he would just kind of go look at me and go like, yeah, Kiri, <laughs> you know, and launch into it. And, <laughs> and, um, which was fun, you know, and, and that's, you know, that's the way he was. He was very spontaneous and he wanted to play, you know, have just people that could follow along and not kind of go, Oh no, mm-hmm. I don't like that tune. Or, yeah, I guess he's got such a huge repertoire, not only of his own stuff, but also, you know, Scots, Irish, old time, bluegrass. I mean, you know, the, the, if he's going to get up and not just have the same set list every night, you've got to be able to keep up. Yeah. Definitely. Or at least kind of be willing to dive in, you know, and yeah. a lot of that stuff, you know, if you've never played it, you know, like I remember there were a couple of hot rice tunes he did that I of course had heard. I'd never actually played, but you know, a lot of this stuff, even if you haven't played it, you might've heard it or you kind of can, you know, follow where, where it's going. And also like the trio we had with, with Mark Schatz, we just kind of felt time the same way. Mm. So, it was all, it was really easy to play together, you know? And it was kind of like, if Tim wanted to play a tune and I didn't really know it, it's like, okay, tell me the key and, you know, Mark and I'll figure out what the, the chords are as we go, you know? It was always fun. And that, that period of, um, of Tim's music sort of, I think that contains some of my favorite, favorite of Tim's stuff. I love, um, a way out on the mountain and the, the sort of yeah. song, which tell from that's just on every playlist I've ever made, I think. It's just, you know, and oh, cool. and stuff like um, Red on Blonde, like, you know, the the guitar on a track like Signor, for example, it's just, it's one of those that, so I think, I think part of what I love about some of those breaks of yours is like in a, in a nominally bluegrass world where there's that constant train of notes and spaces are filled, just having this bits of breath in there and there's bits of air and there's spaces and there's room around some of the notes for you to hear them. In, in a different sort of context, which I love. You've got a, a willingness to leave things out as well as put things in. But it's just really cool to listen oh, to. Oh, thanks. You know, I think for me that comes from, well, when I started playing guitar in like early 70s, 72, 73, you know, I, you know, I'd been listening to whatever was on the radio at the time and, you know, we'll listen to some, you know, rock and roll and stuff. But I hadn't really, when I really started playing the guitar, I, you know, was when the Will the Circle Be Unbroken came out album came out and you know i heard doc watson and it's like that's what i want to do you know um and fortunately i I went off to college and there were a lot of other people that were trying to play old-time music and bluegrass and um but at the time you know if you were the guitar player in a bluegrass band you were also the lead singer Mm. that was just there was no question that was it you know and not very many people were playing you know like playing breaks on fiddle tunes or you know i was listening to clarence white a lot um you know, nobody was, there weren't too many lead, lead guitarists in bluegrass. Um, so, you know, I'd be at the bluegrass jam and you'd be go around the circle and everyone would play solos, except they'd kind of just obvious skip right by the guitar every time, you know. Um, and, but I was also listening to lots of other kinds of music. So what I sort of found myself doing is playing with a lot of singers, um, who are playing all sorts of things, you know, like country and, bluegrass and like sort of old time brother duets or, but, um, and I kind of found myself playing more swing and jazz, but almost, and I had kind of been interested in that, but it always sort of, I often got sort of pulled into something by, by a singer, you know, someone wanting me to help them accompany them or be part of their, their backing band or something. And, you know, when you're, playing with singers, you don't want to necessarily just shred every time there's a solo. Hmm. That's not really going to work with their music. And at the same time, I was getting into jazz and, and just, um, you know, there's this, there's always a breath in that music because it's mostly horn players who have to stop and breathe. So I think, you know, it sort of never even occurred to me. I mean, I, 
I've played plenty of like, you know, solos with nonstop eighth notes and, mm. you know, I, I couldn't, I can shred or could shred, you know, with, as, you know, along with people, but it just sort of never occurred to me. And also with Tim, to me, it was always really important to like, think of like the whole entirety of what's going on in the song, not just, okay, here's my solo. I'm going to, you know, show off what I can do. Um, and with someone like Tim, like his mandolin playing is very percussive and, um, you know, he's playing kind of like pretty steady eighth notes and stuff. And so it just felt like a solo that was a little more lyrical, a little more vocal would like help the general song. And so that I ended up doing that a lot. Um, you know, and, and it might change depending on who I was playing with. Like I played, I, I did a lot of playing with John Reichman, the mandolin player, and his playing is, is more lyrical in a lot of the times. Um, and so maybe I would end up playing a little bit, you know, differently, like more notes or stuff. So I, I feel like I'm always kind of thinking of the sort of overall effect of what I'm doing in the, in the song. And like I said, just playing with singers, you know, they don't, at least the singers I played with, they don't really, they don't really care for you, for you to just sort of sit and shred, you know, mm. when it's, when you have your, your 30 seconds in the song. You know? That's interesting, isn't it? I hadn't thought about it in those terms, but, um, you can go to a sort of jam and sometimes a song is just a vehicle for people to take breaks on. It's just a structure that, you know, and it introduces something and then kicks off and you all go around, but actually singing with this, you know, playing with a singer, particularly somebody like Tim, who really sort of delivers a, a melody in the song, um, is a totally different, you could, you, know, you could be doing the same song in two different contexts. And one of them is just a vehicle for breaks. And the other is much more about delivering a narrative and a, a tune and a, a sort of story almost. Um, yeah. yeah, and it's interesting just hearing you talk about about guitar players who don't sing, because just thinking, you know, I interviewed Brian Sutton last year on the podcast, and I've heard him talk about this in other contexts as well. But and he's sort of been on that journey of becoming a band leader and writing songs and singing songs, and but being a guitar player who doesn't do that classic sort of fronting the band thing must be. Are you, is, I, I didn't even consider it really just that your route into the into the world is maybe slightly different than some other people's. We'll be right back with you just after this. Bluegrass Jam Along is proud to be sponsored by Collings Guitars and Mandolins. If you're attending the NAMM show in January, stop by the Collings booth to say hello to the team, get hands-on with their selection of customised acoustics and electrics, and check out some exciting new prototypes they're working on for 2024. They'll also have a few of their world-class artists on hand demoing various instruments. And if you can't attend, don't forget to follow their Instagram and Facebook accounts throughout the show for photos, videos, and the latest news. Collins guitars are hand-built from the sound up in Austin, Texas. This episode is also brought to you by Peghead Nation, the home of Roots Music Instruction. If one of your 2024 resolutions is to improve as a musician, Peghead Nation is the place to go. They have 65 streaming video courses for guitar, mandolin, banjo, fiddle, dobro, bass and ukulele from some of the leading names in acoustic music. Courses cover bluegrass, old time, Irish music and swing, plus lessons dedicated to improvisation, theory and ear training. Your first course is just $20 a month and you can add more for $10. Try any course free for a month with the promo code JAMALONG. Make 2024 a year of more music at pegheadnation.com. Yeah, I think so. And it, I think what it also does is that it sort of, it sort of put me in a place where I'm hearing like the overall sound of the band because I'm not concentrating on singing. So, mm. you know, whatever 90%, 75 to 90% of the song, I'm, I'm not playing solo. You know, I'm thinking about the overall sound of what's going on. Um, whereas a singer is going to be concentrated on, you know, um, you know, they're them singing because that's the most important thing then. And so I, I think it is a different sort of, you, you find yourself in a different place in the band if you're not singing and hmm. thinking about just the overall sound. Yeah. And because I played a lot of different musics where you're, I was sort of having to create, you know, in bluegrass, there's sort of like, you know, here's the, here's the rhythm guitar style and you sort of play within that style. But I ended up playing with a lot of um, people who, you know, played a, a kind of a variety of 
different things, jazz and country music. And um, I played in a Cajun band. I played electric guitar in a Cajun band once and, you know, playing just diff- with a bunch of different songwriters where you're sort of like creating the part for each song. Mm-hmm. And it's not just, you know, I'll just sort of go into my standard rhythm thing. So I was always thinking about that, you know, whoever I was playing with, with Tim or, or Lori or, or whoever. You know. It's really cool. Cause you get that sort of, um, I mean, like, you know, as musicians, all we are is a collection of influences that we mix together with who we are and it comes out as, as work. But there's a, something I heard you say again recently is, um, cause there's that, this idea of there's a bluegrass sound and bluegrass guitar sounds like this and is this, um, and it, you, you were sort of talking about various influences of yours. And, and then you said you sort of realized you don't have to play like everybody else because there is no everybody else. This sort of sense that. I think it can be easy for people like me who are relatively early in this journey to hear a sound that feels like bluegrass guitar, that maybe it's very heavily Tony Rice influenced these days, but and think that's how I'm supposed to sound. Um, and then, right. but you wander off and listen to all sorts of things, different genres and styles and, you know, and you bring a little bit, you sort of magpie your way through them and bring your little bits back that become part of you. And that's, it's always really empowering to hear people talk about things like that because it's often easy to notice when you don't sound the way you think you ought to and not notice the things that make you, you. Right. I think also, you know, when I started, like I said, there weren't a whole lot of like lead guitar players in, in bluegrass, you know, and I was influenced by Doc Watson and Tony Rice, but if you sort of think about the other people that were playing that also influenced me was, um, so there's Doc and Clarence White and Tony Rice and Norman Blake, Dan Crary, Russ Berenberg. None of them sound the same. Mm. None of them sound alike at all, you know? Um, so there wasn't like one kind of sound where, oh, everybody's playing like this. And, you know, there was a period, I think, in the 90s where, or 80s and 90s, where everyone, you know, 90% of the bluegrass guitar players you would hear would sound like Tony, Tony Rice. Um, and, you know, I kind of figured out, I mean, I definitely was influenced heavily by Tony Rice, his first album in a first few albums in particular, just I would learn solos and stuff. But it, it was pretty clear that I was going to be a second or third rate Tony Rice. So, you know, and I think something about, like one thing that was really influenced by Clarence White was it sort of just, it just sort of felt like, you know, he was different enough from other people, just his timing and his his kind of emphasis on the melody and this kind of different phrasing that it sort of felt like, you know, I wasn't going to sound like him either, but it sort of inspired me to, to kind of play what I hear, heard, not what you expected to, or expected to play. And in the bluegrass world, there is a sort of tendency, you know, to play like everybody else, or even in the jazz world, you know, you're a bluegrass banjo player, you've got to learn all the Earl Scruggs stuff. And, you know, there's that sort of, this is the way it goes kind of approach, you know, and, and I think, or even just like, well, this is the way this tune goes, this fiddle tune goes, you know, this is how you play it. And, you know, I've done enough kind of like historical research or not research so much, just listening to realize that a lot of the way people think, well, this is the way this tune goes, is the way some guy played it on one day mm. when there was a, you know, when he was a, there was a microphone nearby. Um, I interviewed Norman Blake once and we were kind of talking about old time music and this sort of thing of this is the way this goes. And his, his feeling was sort of like, this is the way it goes today. Like, you know, the, the stuff evolves mm. more and you can, like, I, I always think it's important to kind of listen to like sources where, where things came, come from. Um, at least you just sort of have that as a sort of, a place to go from, you know, and then, and also the fact that I, I played old time fiddle for a long time. So to me, there's like, you know, in the old time fiddle, there's really a sense of like, how are you bowing this tune in order to kind of get the right feel. And so, you know, when I came to put those things on the guitar, it wasn't like, Oh, I'm just going to pick every note, you know, down to da 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 There was always this coming from the fiddle where you're trying to get this, this rhythmic feel to it. And you're thinking about how to bow it and in order to get this sound, um, so to me, it was sort of like, yeah, I can take this tune that might have been on the fiddle. I want to learn maybe how it was originally played 
or originally being, you know, the first recording or whatever, but then I'm going to, you know, and I'm never going to sound like that playing it on the guitar. So I just have to find a way to make it sound good to me on the guitar. Yeah. It's really interesting. I interviewed a young guitarist called Cameron Nola um, last week on the podcast, and he was talking about how it's really interesting that so often bluegrass guitarists will learn a tune from another guitarist rather than learning it from a fiddle player or, or they'll, you know, they'll learn Doc's arrangement or a Tony arrangement or a whoever's arrangement of a tune. Um, and it's, but it's come from a guitar source rather than a fiddle source. And if it's a fiddle tune, why not go back and hear how a fiddle would have played it? Right. And also you just get different ideas. Like there's a tune that has kind of, it always kind of bugs me. There's um, temperance reel. Is is pretty much played like Billy in the low ground in the key. The first part is pe- people play it like Billy in the low ground in the key of G. But if you go back to the Irish version, it's it has much. It it doesn't really sound like that at all. It kind of starts in one place and ends up in the the next you know two bars later in the same place. But the way that get there, it gets there. It has this really unique phrasing that isn't like Billy in the low ground at all. And so, to me, it's just sort of a matter of it gives you more ideas. Mm than just sort of taking the, like one version of a tune. I mean, that's part of it too. It's just, you know, in order to really get into a tune, you have to kind of listen to more than one, one version. Yeah. And I've always really identified with that. Some like various forms of music I've played over the year. It's, I've always shied away from having a hundred percent part that I play at the same time every time. But I always used to think it was just because I was too lazy to ever finish a part off properly. But I sort of realised that, it's that I, I like leaving some room to see how it feels on that day. Um, and I think it's really interesting because I struggled with this when I started playing bluegrass guitar was I got confused as to how the tunes were supposed to go because everybody played them differently. And you realise if you learn, like, you know, a few versions of a tune or different ways to phrase certain parts of a tune, you can choose how you feel that day. And it, it sort of leads right. you through to being able to improvise, whereas if you have a version of the tune and that's what you always play, it can be quite um, daunting to start thinking about improvising, but just by playing three different versions of the tune, you've got that, that sort of starting point almost. Yeah. And I think also it's sort of a recent thing This to me, you know, well, it's recent considering I'm <laughs> how old I am, but you know, in the, let's say in the last 20 years, 25 years is the kind of improvising on fiddle tunes without really you know, just sort of improvising on the chords to a fiddle mm. tune. I mean, I think most people, at least the people I had played with and were influenced by, and stuff, they would improvise, you know, small variations on the on the melody, um, but you're always sort of sticking to the melody. And it reminds me this this fiddle player that I learned a lot from back in this when I was first starting, this great fiddle player named Hank Bradley, who was from Seattle. And um, he told me that he, well, he heard old time music when he was in the army at, in North Carolina and he, in the sixties. Um, and he just heard about this fiddle festival and he went to the fiddle festival and, you know, was just totally entranced with the music. And he bought an album by one of the fiddle players or got an album. And so, so he would learn and the fiddle players there, you know, they would kind of vary things like at each time they went through it a little bit by bit and he didn't really understand the tradition. So he learned like if it was a three minute version of this tune, he would learn the entire thing from beginning to end thinking that's the way it went, that it was a through composed tune Mm. that, that in order to play the tune you had, you know, you started with this and, and it didn't occur to him or didn't realize until he started playing with other people that there were, you know, you could kind of change it yourself and that that's, that's what he had been hearing was this fiddle player just doing minor variations as he went along. Um, and I think that that's, that's always sort of been my approach to playing fiddle tunes. Um, I mean, not, not always. I mean, there is, you know, you sort of fall in with what people are doing. I suppose if I, you know, if I'm jamming on a tune these days and people are just kind of improvising on the chords as much as anything, I might get into that as well. But, um, but I was thinking about that and like, you know, through all of my recordings, none of my recordings really do that. You know, I'm always playing the, the tune or kind of small variations on the tune. Um, yeah. And, and it goes, but it goes along with that idea that, 
there is no one way to play it. And so I think one way to kind of understand that there's no one way to play it and to kind of understand how to create versions is just kind of learn different versions or even just like you hear someone play the second half of the A part to Soldier's Joy differently. Just learn, you know, what they did on those couple of measures or something. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned um, Russ Barenberg earlier, who, who I love um, and my sort of probably the most, the biggest context I've heard him play in is in transatlantic sessions. And yeah, and he's often, they're often playing a tune, like a fiddle tune. It could be a Scottish tune, Irish tune, an American tune. Um, and he, he definitely has that sense for me of somebody who you don't feel like he, on that kind of music, he's taking a solo. You just feel like he's delivering the melody with, some extra thought behind it like he's you know he's playing the melody like him um and it's, it's, yeah he once he once he once said to me he said i don't understand this like improvising on fiddle tunes why would you want to improvise on fiddle tunes just play the tune you know they're great tunes there's a lot of great tunes just play it if you want to improvise just learn another tune you know um you know of course he's a great improviser but you know i think for him it was like he would and he is a great composer of tunes and so he would if he wanted to do improvising he would compose something that sort of lent itself to to improvising on the chords or whatever yeah but that and I, it sort of leads me on to I, I signed up for um lessons at peghead nation and took one of your guitar courses and well, there was a point in it there was i think there was a couple of lessons that were just lots of different licks but you basically started the lesson by saying I'm not a massive fan of just teaching people licks. I, you know, I don't, I, you need to know some, so here are some good ones, but I'm, you know, you're not going to just get lesson after lesson of cool, hot licks to play. Um, and I thought that was really cool. And it's sort of, I'd, I'd really like to talk about, about um, Peghead Nation a bit because I, I really, I'm really interested in the, the range of teaching materials available online now, but, but also that the amount of them that involve, players there's a there seems to be a rich a rich tradition in bluegrass of passing it on to the next generation so many sort of photos of successful players now pictured when they were seven playing with their idol and now there's pictures of seven-year-old kids with them and it just feels like it's such a you know it's not just about teaching and delivering information it's about handing this music this music down in various forms um and i'd love to sort of hear a bit about how peghead nation started yeah, we started, I can never remember exactly now, nine, because we were working on it before we actually launched it. So it was like eight or nine years ago. Um, but we'd, so I started it with uh, my two two other partners, Taya Gherkin and Dan Gable, and we'd both been working for Acoustic Guitar Magazine. Um, and there were some changes there that were kind of, um, you know, kind of making us want to go <laughs> go elsewhere. Um, and, you know, and it, and it was also, there was a lot of this kind of, um, video instruction coming along and we'd been doing, I've been doing a lot of, that was kind of always my, my main focus at acoustic guitar. Um, I was editor there for, oh, as, as much as a decade, I kind of came and went a couple of times, but, um, in addition to just sort of interviewing people, you know, it was the, the lessons and we started doing a lot more, you know, we started including audio with the lessons and then video with the lessons, more like just sort of, you know, playing the tune and including that online rather than, than the, the instruction being, it was always based on the stuff that was in the magazine. So when the three of us found ourselves kind of out of the magazine and kind of looking for something else to do, um, Dan and I got together, Dan Gable, my partner, and he had been the, um, uh, assistant publisher of the magazine and editor of acoustic guitar for a little while. Um, and I was saying that I was thinking that I was going to try and start my own little, um, online teaching thing. It was just going to be me. I remember there was a, a gypsy jazz guitar player I knew was doing this Robin Nolan, I think, and he would put up a lesson every month. Um, on some Django Reinhardt tune and, you know, charge whatever he charged. And, you know, he had some subscribers. Um, and I was thinking, you know, that, that I was going to try, that's what I was going to try. And he, he Dan sort of had the idea that, you know, that sounds like, that's a good idea. And, but what if we did it with more than guitar? 
because Dan is a mandolin player and guitar player. And then we just started thinking about, well, I know a lot of musicians and, and it also came from, you know, I used to teach, I haven't in a while, but I used to teach at a lot of music camps and re- and really, you know, until a few years ago when I stopped performing and, and teaching at camps, um, that was a big part of, you know, kind of my year and where I was, you know, my income for that matter. Um, and I, I knew that there was a lot, there were a lot of people at these camps who would come back to the same camp year after year. And, you know, they didn't necessarily have another musical outlet. Um, you know, that maybe they lived somewhere where there was only a couple musicians or, you know, around the, to play with and there weren't any teachers. Um, and I knew that they, a lot of them came back and they played different instruments. They would come back, they would, to play guitar the next year you'd see him and it's like thinking, Oh, you're going to be in my guitar class. Great. And they're like, Oh no, I'm playing mandolin this year. I'm, you know. Um, and so well, I sort of thought of it as this kind of, you know, music camp on your computer where you could kind of go there whenever you wanted. You didn't have to figure out, you know, a lesson time with an instructor who may, there may not be anybody nearby. And also just this sort of, um, that so, so you could kind of jump from one thing to the, to the next and learn tunes on the guitar or the fiddle or the mandolin kind of in your own time. And, um, so we just started to do that. And, and this other, this other friend of ours, colleague Taya was, um, you know, was helping out. He was kind of the gear guy at, at acoustic guitar magazine and doing all the gear reviews and, and had started, you know, doing videos of them too. So, you know, and he had a, he had a garage that was empty and, uh, you know, we set up our studio in his garage and a lot of the way we got started was by getting a lot of partners from manufacturers like Martin and, and, you know, Fishman and, uh, Collings and stuff because they had kind of, Dan had been part of the head of the advertising department, acoustic guitar. So he and Tia knew all those people and that really helped us uh, get going. So, you know, they would, um, you know, we, we'd post video reviews of theirs and they would kind of sign up as partners and, and that helped us, that helped us get started, um, get off the ground. I think that's, that's really cool. And maybe I've got a slightly, um, more sort of specific experience of this being in the UK, but like for me to want to learn bluegrass guitar or mandolin, or there's far fewer teachers around here. There are, there are some, and there are sort of music camps and things, but you know, finding somebody who's going to teach you bluegrass guitar in, you know, wherever you might live in Italy or France, or, you know, there are bluegrass players all over the world, having that access to, to actual, content you know because you can go and buy a book and but it's there's something much more motivating about learning visually with somebody breaking stuff down into bite-sized chunks and you can sort of almost assemble your own curriculum from the content out there and it's a it's a really it's a really sort of cool way to learn um and it's it's that sense of i think like you can pick a lesson and you can work it until you've got it and then move on to the next thing and sometimes you know a book can feel quite overwhelming you start on page one and you know there's 200 pages of black and white notes written down and you sit and you work down um, and just seeing somebody play and go that's where they put their hand or that's how they do it such you know there's so much you can convey with that yeah i think you know and i i started you know, when we got into this, I'm, I'm kind of really interested in the way people learn. And partly because, you know, I'd have students that were like, why are you doing that? How are you, why did you learn to, you know, and I'm trying to figure out like how, when, when people have started like with like trying to correct bad habits, mm-hmm. you know, cause especially with the guitar, there's no Suzuki method, you know, there's no, like with the violin, um, generally, you know, people pick up the guitar and they, 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 learn some chords and they play by themselves for a couple of years. And then they sort of figure out, okay, I need to really, I want to buckle down and actually learn this. And they may have developed some bad habits, you know, by that point. So I was, I've always been sort of interesting. It's like, okay, why are you doing, why is, why do we, what do we need to do to fix that? So a lot of this, you know, I'm kind of just interested in the way people learn and how to, how to teach people who want to learn to play 
but not necessarily people that wanted to learn to become, you know, working musicians or virtuosos or whatever, because there is a sort of, I think if you're going to be that sort of person, you learn by osmosis a lot and you learn by watching and you don't necessarily think about like, well, how is my pick supposed to move? You know, I kind of naturally did alternating picking when I was starting to play bluegrass because I saw Doc Watson play and the guitar players that I saw play um, did that. And it's just like, oh, they're just moving their hand up and down. Um, mm. It wasn't like, oh, you've got to make sure you're playing the down strokes on the down. But, you know, there wasn't any kind of like, what is your pick doing? You just kind of naturally see that. So I think it definitely helps to have the visual, at least for a lot of people, is just to see where your how your hand, what your hands look like. Um, and also, I think the the thing about with books is with this music, it's really helpful to learn by ear because when you go to the jam session, you're not going to have your book with you. Um, and you know, playing with other people is really the the best way to learn this stuff. And um, I mean, you can certainly enjoy it, you know, and just sort of play tunes by yourself, but, you know, muscle memory is super important, um, in, in playing this stuff and you're not going to get it unless, you know, the best way to get it is just sort of by playing things over and over with other, other people. And the, the nature of the music is that that's what happens. You play the, the tune over and over, you know, and, uh. So I th yeah, I think it's really important that kind of learning by ear and also, you know, being able to see see what somebody's doing. And so, which um, which courses did you start off with? Because there's a, you know, there's sort of dozens on there now. Were there particular sort of courses and instruments that were the core at the beginning? Yeah, we just we started with one or two per instrument. I started with it was just flat picking guitar, um, and. And, and, I, and I was sort of at a kind of advanced level. Um, it's what the, what the advanced flat picking guitar course is now. Um, cause that's kind of where I was. We had a beginning guitar course. Um, I think those and a finger style guitar course. I think those were the three first three, one, three, we started with guitar. Oh, blues guitar. So we were kind of thinking of the sort of, you know, finger style, flat picking, you know, beginning just sort of learning basic chords and, um, you know, learning to sing kind of root songs, you know, country and um, songs. Um, and then we had a f fiddle course, just just fiddle. <laughs> um, Chad Manning's great local fiddle player that I played a lot with. And he's, you know, he's played a lot with. And a, a lot of the people we started with were local because it was going to be easier that way, you know, just to have someone come over and, you know, we didn't have to fly people anywhere. Um, and there are a lot of great local musicians in the Bay Area. So we started with um, Chad at this fiddle course. And, you know, he's played with uh, David Grisman and Laurie Lewis and lots of great fiddle players. And Sharon Gilchrist was living in the Bay Area at the time. And so she started with the beginning mandolin course and she had a real sense of how she wanted to teach beginning mandolin. And, um, she had, a, she was doing a lot of teaching at the time. So that was really get, great. And that's been our most popular course since we started. Um, and also I've been playing with Joe Walsh, Joe K Walsh, mm -hmm. even, even though he was in, uh, New England, I just, I wanted him, you know, to teach. And we ended up calling it the advancing mandolinist. So I think we started with those. And then Bill Evans, the banjo player, was also in the Bay Area. So we started with him on beginning banjo and bluegrass banjo. Um, Mike Witcher, the dobro player and, do and teacher, um, was nearby. He was in Central California. And I think that's what we started with. Oh, and ukulele. We, we had a ukulele course um, with Marcy Markser. So... <laughs> I mean, is that eight or something like that? Something. Well, it's cool because, like, you know, particularly like mandolin now, it feels like there's quite a range of courses there. There's sort of Irish, there's this the beginning, advancing, there's a chord melody course, there's, you know, you've got um, Mike Compton doing the more sort of Monroe style. You've got a, a real range of mandolin courses on offer there. There's so much for people to, to go for. Um, often mandolin just gets lumped in as the mandolin course. And it's, you know, right. there's, there's some really, particularly something like the chord melody course is a very 
sort of specific branch of of what's out there, but it means you can really dig into it in a, a huge amount of depth, and there can't be that many people out there that could teach you that. No. Um, I, one thing is that we've always had a lot of interest in mandolin courses. I'm not sure exactly why. It's sort of always been the most popular instrument. Well, actually, I do I, I do think there's a, there might be a reason why. Is, you know, in most towns you live, there's probably a guitar teacher, mm -hmm. right? Um, even if it's not the, the style you want to learn to play, you can learn and maybe you can bring in a, some record that you want to learn and they might be willing to try and help you learn it. There's probably a violin teacher. And in these days, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot of violin teachers will teach a few fiddle tunes as, especially as beginning stuff. So, um, but there's probably not necessarily going to be a mandolin player in, in your town, or if there is, they may not teach or, you know, or a banjo player necessarily. So, um, so for some reason, um, we've just, there's been a lot of interest in mandolin. And so we've kept at it. And, you know, uh, like, you know, like I said, I've always been interested in a sort of wide range of, of music. Um, and so it was sort of natural for me to like, for like, um, there's a the Irish mandolin teacher, Marla Fibish. She lives nearby. And so that was, you know, she's a great teacher and um, there's interest in mandolin. And so we got her to do that. And then we decided, well, we need an Irish fiddle player as well. And we ended up getting the guy I'd gone to college with, like, you know, 50 years ago. So it's great fiddle player, Dale Russ, who lives in Seattle, but is, you know, one of the best Irish fiddle players in the country. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of it was I just, you know, there were people I knew, mm. uh, you know, most of these people were people I knew and also people, you know, it wasn't just like great players or my friends or whatever. Right? So it was people I knew who could teach, like people who had taught at music camps, because it's pretty strange, even if you're used to teaching a lot or teaching at camps to a group to sit down in front of a camera with no feedback from a student mm. and just sort of spew out your your teaching you know um and it, you know it, it takes a, people you know a while to get used to it even if you're teaching like a group of you know 20 guitar players and you have a half an hour at least you're you're getting some feedback you know you you see the sort of puzzled look in their their eyes and you go oh i need to explain that a little bit more you know um and obviously people will ask questions too but since there's no feedback there it, it takes people a while. So I wanted to make sure it was people that could, could teach. And, uh, and it, and, you know, it was also sort of kept it interesting for me. I do all the, um, or, or most of the transcribing for the music for the, for Peghead Nation. So, you know, I know exactly how Bruce Molsky, mm -hmm. I can predict how Bruce Molsky will bow a fiddle tune now, you know, cause I've transcribed a hundred of his yeah. tunes, you know, and, uh, you know, I could probably play bluegrass banjo. I can't, my fi fingers can't, but you know, I've, I've notated so much bluegrass, um, banjo music and, and climber banjo music that, so it's, it's always just kept it interesting for me. That's kind of one thing that's kept me going there is mm. just the different course. Uh, that's interesting because you've got, um, you've got Wes Corbett teaching banjo on, on the site. I interviewed Wes a while ago and he's clearly somebody who thinks very deeply about about how banjo is taught and how that can be sort of advanced and, you know, how I think he, he talked quite a lot about this, this very established ways of teaching guitar and people are just so used to it and the way the music is written. And, and um, he's, you know, very, very keen to sort of promote the banjo a bit more in that way. And I think it's fascinating just like, talking to you about this and talking to, you know, somebody like Brian Sutton, people who, who think very much about teaching and how to convey not just the mechanics of what you do, but the how to be a musical human being and how to approach things as well, you know. Um, and it is, I think you're right, it's a very it's a very different skill from just being able to do something and having somebody sit and show you a thing in a way that translates when you can't ask them a question is a, is a real skill. Yeah. I think there's, you know, I, can, I sort of think of, and this could could maybe sound a little bit, um, um, and I say, I don't know, arrogant or something, but I, I sort of think of there are musicians and there are people who play music. There's like sort of two people, two kinds of people. Um, 
And that, that may sound a little bit like, like I'm putting down people who play music, but if you think about it, it's sort of like, if you ask somebody what they do and they say they're a musician, then they're a musician. If you ask some, you know, there are a lot of people who play music who won't say, yeah, I'm a musician. That's what I do. But if you ask them what they like to do for fun or what they do on the weekends, they you say they play music mm. and teaching those two th- kinds of people, I think are really, is really different. Um, I mean, not all musicians, not every musician are the same, for instance, but I think I've had to figure out and, and also with some instructors, I've had to kind of push them to kind of figure out, well, this may be the way you learned something, but that's not the best way to teach someone who isn't just sort of obsessed with music, thinking about music all day long. Mm. You know, the people that, that have their half hour a day to when they start thinking about how to play the guitar. And I think there, you need to sort of approach it from, especially because you don't know who's out there. You don't know who you're teaching, what their level is, is to, to think about, like, for instance, um, I had a really good student once, you know, he came to me and he was learning all sorts of fiddle tunes and, you know, teaching him how to figure out breaks to songs and, you know, technically really good and really intelligent, but he had the hardest time remem- remembering the chord progressions to tunes. Mm. And like, he just couldn't, he just couldn't do it. And, and I realized that he'd mostly played by himself. Um, and there's sort of a thing, like I started out the first, the first real musical situation I had was playing guitar with a square dance band. And in the college, it was a, a weekly square dance and I would go and I play guitar and soon I started to play fiddle, but you know, you just sit up there for playing the same tune for, 10 minutes, you know, and you're sitting there playing for two or three hours and you really get kind of beat into you how long eight bars mm. is like, and, and this is really important for improvising. Like if you're going to improvise on an eight bar section, it's really important if you know, like when that eight bars is done without kind of counting or watching the, somebody else playing the chords, but you just, you know, you internalize how long four bars is how long eight bars is, how long 12 bars is. And for somebody who's never done that, they've mostly been kind of in their room reading music. They don't have that sense of, you know, you know, when the chords change or when the chords should be done. Um, So there are lots of things that, you know, maybe people who got into music and just kind of got into it, you know, like me, like you learn all these things without really thinking about it. Mm. Um, and then you maybe have to figure out how to convey that to people who aren't as involved in, in music or didn't in, get into it at such an early age. And do you ever get um, like the opportunity to get like feedback from your students or get a sense of the people that have, because you must have taught, you know, hundreds, thousands of people through Peghead Nation over the, over the past decade. Um, do you ever get the opportunity to hear from people and, and get that feedback? Yeah, we do. Um, we st- When we started out, we had this, we wanted to have this little sort of bulletin board style, like, you know, maybe people could chat about the lessons and kind of, you know, ask each other how, you know, or post questions to students as well as instructors. So we set up a page for each instructor to, you know, take questions. And it didn't really it didn't really work out that way. People ask questions of the instructor and, you know, most of the instructors are kind of busy with all sorts of other things. And um, some, some instructors were great about answering questions and I ans- ans- answered a lot of questions and, and, but we didn't really get that, that sort of, you know, active bulletin board. Show. But this was at the point where like, you know, everybody's on Facebook and Instagram and there's like, you know, already five social media sites that you're following or whatever. So, but we did get a lot of feedback from students that way. And there were a lot of things that we, one of the nice things when we started was that the website we started, we could modify pretty easily. Um, we had a, you know, we had a bluegrass banjo player, uh, who helped us design the site. And it was basically like kind of a, uh, a blog style thing. So we could do a, a lot of different things ourselves. And so like one of the, 
things we started doing with the we did with our play video play along tracks was from a student of mine who said, you know, I was kind of talking about it and he was saying, you know, it'd be really helpful if you just had like a guitar playing the chords, because then you can see the chords. You don't have to be looking, you know, at the, at the music to see what the chords are. You can see, oh yeah, he's playing a G chord and then he's going to a C Mm -hmm. chord and you can see where he is in the song. So, you know, that was like, okay, yeah, let's do that. Um, And we were able to kind of change things, you know, based on feedback pretty easily. Um, we still do that, but it's a little harder because we've gotten a more kind of more stable and advanced website, a better website that, you know, will allow us to keep, keep going. <laughs> so that's, that was always also one of the challenges. You realize that basically like, you know, websites kind of phase out after five years. It's kind of like, you know, technology is like, um, and you have to figure out how to make, make things keep going and also just adjust to the way, you know, what things are people, people are used to doing, but yeah, we so we do get a lot of feedback from people. And essentially, you know, I work in my, my day job, I work for a website in a completely non-technical capacity, but when you have a website that people rely on and it's up and it's running and the content's there and people are using it, it's like, I, we sort of compare trying to revamp it so it's a bit like trying to service your car while it's doing 75 miles an hour down the fast lane of the motorway like you can't pull over and do it you've got to do all this while people are still using it right um yeah it's always a challenge well and it's also it's a challenge because it's like having a a, you know 24-hour restaurant or something you're you know you've got to feed people when they want to eat Mm. you know and so someone who's like you know the time they're they're on uh, you know, they want to get on the computer and play their guitar is, you know, 5 a.m. in the morning in England, you know, well, we're, we're sleeping or it's, you know, and if the site is down, then, you know, so we were, we had a, we had one day when the site was down and we couldn't figure out how to fix it. And, uh, and it was like, okay, we need to, this <laughs> needs to fix because, you know, <laughs> for one thing, it's like, you know, we're, it's a monthly subscription thing. And if the site goes down, then we're not making any money next month. I mean, we're making zero money if people can't get the, mm. <laughs> their money. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge, but it, you know, it's been fun. And one of the really cool things, um, we sort of chatted a couple of months ago and scheduled this interview. And then a couple of weeks ago, I was watching the IBMA awards announcements on their Facebook stream and, uh, Peghead Nation is getting a Distinguished Achievement Award from IBMA this year. Yeah. Did, did you know that was yeah, coming? Very excited. Uh, a couple of days before the, the announcement, they, uh, you know, they warned us, you know. So. That's really cool. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it really means a lot, you know. Um, I have been, you know, involved with IBMA. I, th- I first went in 1989, I think. Um, and, you know, it was back then it was smaller. It was mostly kind of almost like a trade organization, you know, musicians, professional musicians kind of trying to, you know, get help and, you know, meet record companies and festival things. And, you know, it's turned into this huge thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it's a great organization. So yeah, it's, it's really an honor to be, to, to be recognized in that way. And also it's a little interesting because to me, it sort of feels like, like the first year we went to IBMA, and I think this was 2016 or 2015, we went there and we sponsored the um, the, the workshop stage at the festival. Um, and, you know, it's sort of one thing to sort of take like bluegrass and old time music instruction in like into the heart of where it comes from. And, you know, we literally got like people who would say $20 a month. I can get my uncle to teach me the banjo for free. You know, like that's, it wasn't, you know, we weren't like an obvious um, great thing for that community because that community, especially in that area, there's, yeah, there's plenty of people around that you can get to, you can take banjo lessons from or fiddle lessons, or you can go to a festival and in your, the town, uh, you know, next to yours or something. And so it, it really meant a lot that, you know, that, that IBMA would, you know, 
would uh, you know be hip to what we're doing and and, and appreciate it the way they do. And I guess you know sort of the I and IBMA stands for international. And if there's there's one yeah. thing that can take music and instruction around the world, it's a website that's accessible wherever you are, whenever you want it to be. Um, there's something yeah. you know very accessible about that. Yeah, and it, it's you know it's cool. We've got um, I think we can actually. We could call ourselves International Peghead Nation if we wanted to now that we have this Choro Mandolin course, uh, this Brazilian Choro Mandolin course taught by Ian Curi, who's a Brazilian, young Brazilian virtuoso. And he shot all the videos in Brazil with his band. So they recorded like backing tracks in Braz- with this Brazilian Choro band, which was really, really, really cool to be able mm. to do. Um, but yeah, it's all, and it's also, um, it's really great to hear from people, you know, around the world, or we get letters in, in German, you know, from asking about things. And, and um, it's a little challenge. We've been doing these, you know, when the pandemic hit, we realized that um, people were going to be used to using Zoom. And so we dar- started doing some Zoom workshops. And those have been done really well, but then it became more of a challenge. It's like, well, what time is going to be good for people? Because, you know, if you're, if you're doing something live. So we realized we needed to re we needed to record those and then make them available for people. And, and that's been a really, it worked out really well for us too. I think there's also a, you know, there, there's kind of a, you know, I always thought the idea of, of this, of just having lessons up there for people to do whenever they wanted to was great. But I think for some people, they prefer the sort of like, okay, Saturday, every Saturday morning at, at 10 a.m., I have to go to mm-hmm. my banjo class. You know, it's sort of, it, it kind of, it, it gets them there rather than kind of, oh, I should probably go mow the lawn or I should go probably go to the grocery store or something, you know. Um, so those have been really successful and it's allowed us to teach some things that it's harder to do in this, this sort of lesson way. Like we've done a lot of, um, workshops on improvising and sort of creating solos and that, and that just sort of, it became a better way to do that than a kind of, you know, 20 minute lesson at a time to be able to have an instructor and then, you know, for an hour and be able to talk about things and expand on things that way. Mm. Yeah. It's, that is interesting. This, this sort of, um, I think sometimes if something's in your calendar for a time and a day, then you just do it. Whereas you think I'll fit in at some point this week, the week, the week yeah. just gets full. And but there's also that, that nice sense of accountability as well of going, you know, I've said, I'm going to show up on this day at this time. So, I'll, you know, I'm going to do yeah. it. Um, but, the, but also the joy of just being able to access a lesson whenever you want it, whenever you need it, you might wake up in the morning and go, I really want to learn gold rush today. And you can yeah. go and do it, you know, so they're both of those are really cool. Um, I'm aware we're sort of coming up towards our hour, but I'd really like to ask you quickly if you've got a little bit of time. You've got the other thing I didn't realize when we set this interview up. Um, I only found out a couple of days ago. Is you've got a new record out in the I next do. couple of weeks. Well, it's good. it'll be out on um, August 19th. Yeah, um, and this is um, for you know bluegrass for the bluegrass world and the flat picking world. This isn't going to sound a whole lot like what you've heard from me. Um, I sort of mentioned that I played a lot of different kinds of music. Um, in the eighties, I was mostly focused on playing electric guitar, late, the latter half of the eighties and kind of modern jazz kind of influenced a lot by, uh, Bill Frizzell, John Schofield, a lot of the kind of contemporary jazz at that time. Um, and I've always sort of had that at the time I was in Seattle and Seattle, um, has a very, the music scenes there all kind of overlapped. You know, I was friends with, uh, I kind of came up in the folk scene, but I knew, you know, people in the rock and roll scene. I had a friend who ended up, you know, playing with REM, you know, and, and, um, you know, just sort of the scenes all kind of overlapped a lot. And so that, I, and, I, and then when I moved to the Bay Area to start playing with Lori, you know, it's a lot bigger here and the scenes are very, very separate. And so when I came down here having played jazz, I wasn't really, it wasn't really obvious how I was going to make, you know, find my way into the jazz scene. And in a way at that time, like, I think among a lot of people, bluegrass was sort of 
thought of as hillbilly music. I mean, I've actually like got that response when I went to a kind of a party and sort of like bluegrass, isn't it? You know, isn't that like hee haw? And, you know, um, and I think, you know, that's changed a lot, you know, but uh, at the time I didn't, so I, I wasn't playing jazz, um, but I was also always kind of doing it at home. And, you know, every once in a while it sort of come out in some things I was doing um, when I played with Daryl Anger, that, that happened a lot, but I just kind of wanted to go back and look at that kind of music and sort of, the, and kind of in, use all my influences. Um, so I, it's an all, all original record, guitar, acoustic guitar, electric guitar, and, uh, bass and drums, programmed bass and drums. Um, so it, it came out of that. It also came out of, and we may be going over here, but, um, uh, I had a bad bike accident a little over a year ago and I couldn't really use my index finger on my, my left hand for about three months. Mm. And so, um, um, and just kind of in the, in kind of getting back into rehabbing, I found myself playing a lot of, a lot of jazz. Um, it was kind of helpful. Like, like the hardest thing for me to do right now is play a standard C chord. Mm. <laughs> That it still hurts for me to play a C chord, but actually playing, stretching out my hand and playing more up the neck kind of jazz chords was easier. So I ended up just working on a lot of that stuff and, and kind of went back to things I'd written before and I was doing a lot of writing jazz. And so, um, so that's, yeah, that's what the new album is. It'll be out on Bandcamp and hopefully all the streaming things on August 19th. Excellent. Well, good luck with that. Um, and congratulations again on the IBMA award. That's a really cool thing. Um, just, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's so just nice to also that recognition of, of, of teaching in general is, a, you know, it's, 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 it's showing the world, I guess, that, that, that that's an important part. It's one of the things I love about IBMA is that it celebrates the musicians and the songwriters and the bands and the entertainers, but it also celebrates writers and, broadcasters and it's you know it, it um it covers the whole spectrum of what goes on that makes this music what it is and i think an, an award like this right. for for delivering quality teaching content is a really cool thing yeah i think that award you know is really cool but like you said you know the people have gotten it or like people that have been putting on festivals for 50 years or you know small like bluegrass magazines for 30 years or whatever you know it's really it it's a award for people that have been supporting the music and really, you know, making it happen with who don't really get any recognition. And so, um, to me that, that, that was, I just, it's a great honor to, to have gotten that with my, with my colleagues. And that's the other thing that was fun. Just, you know, it's not, I can share it with, you know, with my, my colleagues and also for just sort of trying to like, you know, sort of advance the music, not just for, you know, some, something that i happen to do yeah yeah very cool um thanks so much for doing this it's been a, a real treat i've really enjoyed it well thank you matt i appreciate it Bluegrass Jamalong is proud to be sponsored by Collings Guitars and Mandolins, making some of the finest guitars and mandolins in the world since the 1970s. Visit collingsguitars.com and find out why.